Okay, so in this talk, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about intro gradient and specifically about uh, the implication of some approximations that we usually do in implementing certain second order methods and uh, how these approximations relate to intro gradient. Um, and yeah, this is joint work with Joshua. Um, so what's natural gradient? Um, so natural gradient has been introduced. Okay, so natural gradient has been introduced in the 80s, um, and um, so Amari and, and co-authors were the first to introduce this algorithm. So the idea is to move in the functional space. So what does that mean? Um, for every uh, parameter value that you have, for every theta for your model, you get a different function. And you can see that certain changes in theta can, so certain large changes in theta can induce a very small change in your functional behavior. In the extreme case, you could change some parameter value and your function doesn't change at all. And on the other hand, you can have very small changes in your parameter and then results in a very different function. Uh, just think of a recurrent net and you make the weights larger and then you get the exploding gradient and it changes quickly. Um, so the idea is, Instead of, of uh, taking steps in the parameter steps and then taking fixed length steps in the parameter space, you want to take these steps in the functional space and you want to look at, at functions that are equally distant one from each other. Um, and um, the algorithm was introduced based on, on concepts from information geometry, but here we're going to use a different approach to introduce it more, more explicitly. Um, and this is something similar to what Hesk has done. Uh, so the idea would be, you could think of natural gradient as some form of trust treatment method, where what you're doing is at each step you're solving the constraint optimization, where you minimize the first order Taylor expression of your loss, L, under some uh, constraint. So this, this gives you the trust region. And the constraint is on the chiral divergence between the probability density function that represents your model. So, so basically you're saying, I want the, the change in my Kyle to be constant from, from you know, once I take a step. Um, and because this is a first order Taylor expansion, you can see that you always jump at the border of your trust region. So this is a depiction, so you can see you have this, the, the, the direction is given by, by the gradient, and then you're basically the size of your, of your, of your step is given by, by this trust region. Um, and this approach has certain advantages. So for one thing, you don't suffer from plateaus as you do for HGD because what you're doing is you're moving in functional space and a plateau is exactly this. The function doesn't change by much when you change your parameters. Um, the other thing is uh, your, uh, you can re-parameterize your model and the behavior of, the, of your um, optimization is going to be the same because again the functional behavior of your model doesn't matter, is the same regardless of how you parameterize your model. Um, so. Um, Specifically for neural networks, we have to deal with uh, conditional distributions for for MLPs and things like this. Um, so um, in order to get the, the standard formula for natural gradient, what you usually do, so you take you can take this constraint optimization that I talked before, uh, and you use Lagrange multipliers, and then uh, basically move the constraint up, and and then when you solve this, you get a formula that is very similar to the Newton step. So it's basically the gradient times the inverse of some matrix. Uh, the difference now is that this matrix, instead of being the Hessian, is the Fisher information matrix. Um, and the Fisher information matrix is, as you can see it written here, is uh, the product of a matrix transpose, so this Jacobian times itself. So it's positive definite by construction. So that's another advantage, because when you do second order methods and you have to deal with the Hessian, you usually have these problems from, from negative curvature. Um, things like that cannot happen here by construction. Um, and the other thing you can notice is that the Fisher information matrix doesn't contain any second order information. And indeed, if you look at it from, uh, from a, a information geometry perspective, it, it is a first order method on the, on the manifold, on the underlying manifold. Um, so one question that you can ask is, can you add second order information to it? Um, and this is something um, that people have tried doing, and specifically uh, Gonzalez and Donsolo tried to do this for MLPs, and Onkela um, and my co-authors tried to do this in, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, so they also tried to do this. So the idea, um, in both cases, the idea that they had was to use as a second order method to use nonlinear conjugate gradient. 
Um, and the reason for, for, for choosing linear quantity gradient is because it doesn't really require basic computer Hessian. It's kind of complicated to compute the right Hessian on the manifold. Um, and if you try to do a, like a nonlinear conjugate gradient on the underlying manifold, and they call this algorithm natural conjugate gradient, but you end up with basically the same algorithm where the gradients are now the natural gradients, and then any inner product you has to be an inner product on the on the manifold. An inner product on the manifold is just you know the two vectors, you, 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 but you have to multiply them by the metric in the middle that describes the geometry, the local geometry. Um, so one problem that, or one, one assumption that both this paper had to do is if you, if you look at the uh, polar trivia formula to get your new conjugate direction, um, you end up needing to compute the, the inner product between the gradient, gradient to the next step and the, the previous step. And um, this gradient, they belong to different time spaces, so there are different metrics that describe the geometry. Uh, so what they did is they assumed that the the geometry doesn't change by much, so basically they just pick one of the one of the tangent spaces and they assume the gradients are the same in both. And, and we we argue that this assumption can be harmful because when you when you implement such an algorithm, what you're trying to do is to move as far as you can. And if you do that, you know, it's it's highly unlikely for the metric to stay constant. It actually has to change. Um, so what you end up doing is you have to take small steps for this uh, for, being able, for, for you to be able to compute this in our product reliably. Um, so next we're going to look at some second order method, uh, starting with the Hessian key optimization that was introduced by, by James Martins, uh, and we'll show how these optimizations relate to nature gradient. Um, so James Martin introduced Hessian key as a second order optimization and it has a specific list of things that you have to do to get a method right, but among them is you have to use the extended gauss Newton approximation of the Hessian. And it turns out that this approximation is actually just the Fisher information matrix. And if you look back, if you think back of how the formula of natural gradient is, uh, basically what you get is that you can interpret Hessian pre optimization as just being some form of natural gradient um, because they're just using the Fisher information matrix instead of the Hessian. Um, this equality is true under some constraints, but there are constraints that usually are respected in practice. Um, Nicola Larue and co-authors, uh, they try to reinterpret natural gradients, so they introduce natural gradient uh, by assuming that every gradient is Gaussianly distributed around the true gradient. Um, uh, they call the method natural gradient, but it's not the same as a Maris natural gradient. And uh, to disambiguate between these two algorithms, I will use Tonga, which is the name they gave to the specific implementation of the algorithm. Um, and the reason is not true is because what they end up doing is they end up to compute an expectation where both X and Y are sampled from the empirical, while the Fisher information matrix requires Y to be sampled from the model distribution. And if you, if you go back to this con uh, trust region view of, of, the, of the model, what turns out is that some guy is just um, kind of the same thing, just that instead of imposing a constraint on the kind of divergence, you're imposing a constraint on the expected change in your loss. So it's just, uh, should give you like an impression of how this method is different. Um, yet another algorithm that was proposed for deep learning was kind of such with descent. So this was the analysis of Obey. Um, so this algorithm also uses the extended gauss Newton approximation. So because of that, it is a natural gradient method, but it What's more interesting about it is that um, when, when they construct this trilobe subspace, they add the previous descent direction to it. So you can rewrite the math a bit, and what you get back is something that looks very similar to um, nonlinear conjugate gradient or natural conjugate gradient. But the only difference is that now instead of using polarity as you compute uh, the beta factor, you're actually optimizing for it. Um, so what we try to do next is we, we took all this understandings and then we try to put them together and see if we can do something better. So what we've done to improve the natural conjugate gradient um, was to use like a Hessian P approach to invert the Fisher information metric and then similar to Krylov's uh, space descent, we used like an off-the-shelf optimizer to solve for both alpha and beta in the nonlinear conjugate gradient steps. And this algorithm is the one in red, which performs slightly better than the other ones. Uh, in, in blue and black, we have Hessian P. Um, you see and here you have the, the original uh, natural conjugate gradients that use the polar PPR formula, and in green you have HGD. 
Uh, we looked at other properties of natural gradient. One of them is, uh, if you look at, at, at the formula of the natural gradient of this uh, price region method, you notice that you have to evaluate two, two expectations. So the question is, what happens if you use the same examples or if you use different examples to compute these expectations? And um, our intuition is that if we use different examples, we reduce the, the correlation between this expectation and we get a better behavior. And you can see this in practice. And what's even more interesting is you don't actually need the labels to compute efficient information ethics. So you can actually use unlabeled data. And that actually behaves like a regularizer because what you're doing is you're preventing uh, to take steps in the direction that would change the model far away from the training set. And the last experiment that we've done is we wanted to see how much the order of the training set influences the, 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 the final algorithm. So uh, what we've done is we had like a huge training set, we split it in two, and then the first half was split in ten pieces. And then what we did is we keep everything fixed except one of the species, like for example D, and then we run five different models where we resample the data within this segment. And then we look at how similar the behavior of the model is at the end. And you notice this curve, so the first examples have a, a big influence on how the, the, the model behave at the end, but what's interesting is that a natural gradient ends up um, being a lot more robust to this uh, random permutation of the data than, than, than it should be. So this is a uh, lot scale. So this is experimentally similar to one done by Dimitri Han in a previous paper. Um, the study the natural gradient. Uh, so a few conclusion of what we've done here. So um, we believe that understanding the relationship between the different second order methods that have been proposed can be useful not only in figuring out what would be the next steps, but also understanding when these algorithms should perform well and why they sometimes underperform. Um, the approximations that we make are very important, and sometimes they can end up resulting in a totally different algorithm than the one that you described. Um, and yes, we believe that more work in this direction could be helpful to, to make second order methods work for deep learning even better than they do right now. Um, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to thank Guillaume de Jardin, Aaron Cornell, Yanda Pendi, Yawa, and the lay viewers for this work. So does it then help with the deep learning to get rid of these uh, vanishing gradients, or, I mean... Um, okay, uh, the vanishing gradient and Hessian fee. Uh, it's not clear yet why Hessian fee helped with the vanishing gradient. There is yet no theoretical strong reason why it should help. So there is some intuition. So basically the intuition was um, that all the, all the different components of the gradient are, you know, it's a really high dimensional space, so they might end up being orthogonal, so you can have this visual information that is scaling them independently and kind of making them on the same norm. Um, so this is like an intuition of how, how um, second order methods could help with the vanishing gradient. But it's not, it's not really clear why it does. There, it, I do believe it doesn't really address the underlying, underlying problem, the vanishing gradient problem. I think that's a separate problem. I think we should look for separate solutions for that. Other questions? Uh, I just had a question on for your slide nine. If you could go back, uh, it's my favorite experiment of mine. Uh, so it seems like if you so what you're doing here is you're perturbing <coughs> the data set at every one of these places. Yes. And then you're measuring the. the what the effect of that is on how you're changing, on the output of the yes. training. So it seems interesting that it's just a straight slide down. Uh, I don't, I still don't really understand why, why it would behave. Like, so for example, uh, lowering the learning rate would have that effect. Yeah, so in this case we did, um, we did look for the learning rate such that the model ends up to have the same foundation error, so we kind of control for this. Um, and the idea was uh, that at the end of learning, both algorithms made the same kind of progress in learning. Um, yes, using learning grade, you can artificially lower down one of the curve or the other. But I don't think that by at least not, if you just saw we had a constant learning grade throughout learning. And by using that learning grade, you cannot individually change the position of, of, of certain points. And you just lower the whole, the whole curve or not. Um, and I, we hope to control for that by, by using the validation error. 
Um, the slide, I mean, it is obvious that the first, in, the first training example should have a higher importance because if you think of it like in, in, that, in, that, in this time frame, you're, you're picking the, the basin of attraction of the, of the local minima where you land or zero point or whatever, um, then yes, this is the more important, it, it has to have bigger influence because you can end up picking different local minimas. And you know, later on, once you are in that basin of attraction, it doesn't really matter what examples you see. Uh, why it's so smooth? I, I, that I don't know. <laughs> Uh, any other questions for Rosa? <coughs> it's not. It's not. Let's make them. Okay.